see you guys here, and uh, and glad that you are a part of what's going on. Um, I told you earlier, but uh, I'll I'll go over it again. We are going to, uh, guys. I guess you all hear that, but that's a terrible, terrible feedback thing. Um, we are going to do tonight a uh, kind of a, a different thing. We're going to do a break in between our series. We just come out of worship, and next week we'll be starting our series on, on sex and dating. And uh, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, we live in a world that's saturated by sex. Um, did you know that in, uh, I think it's seven minutes of TV that you watch, you've already seen 40-some-odd sexual situations? And, uh, and, and I mean, it's just crazy how much stuff that is saturated in in sex, and see, sex is not a bad thing. Sex is actually a good thing. God invented sex, but only inside of marriage. And so, we're going to go over that and explain what God says about it, because we hear all the time about what our, all these uh, seniors think about it and what this world thinks about it. But we're going to see what God Himself says about it. Okay, so we'll be starting that next week, and so you don't want to miss that. But tonight, we're going to do something a little different. And tonight, uh, this message is entitled "Abandoned." Now, I want you guys to think just for a minute. How many of you all have ever seen an abandoned house? Any, any abandoned house people in here? Okay. How many of you guys have ever seen an abandoned car? Maybe an airplane, boat, anything like that? Have you all seen something abandoned? Now, what makes it abandoned? Nobody in it. The owner's what? Gone. There's no owner. Deserted. What else? There's all sorts of stuff that makes it abandoned. So what I want to ask you tonight, and what I want you to think about, is I want you to look into your life tonight, and I want you to ask the question to yourself, am I abandoned? Is the house that I live in right here, my soul, is it abandoned? Because I'm going to tell you a little bit more about two types of people here in just a few minutes, but I want you to ask yourself, am I abandoned? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, thank you for this day. God, thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to come together, Lord, and to speak your word and speak life over these students. And Father God, I, I thank you for them. Lord, I thank you for the blessing that they are in, in my life and in the staff's life, Father God, and just for the opportunity to just be here weekly, Lord, and just hang out with them and laugh with them and, and cut up with them, Father God, and then get to teach them about you and how much you love them and, and what kind of plans you have for them, Father God. And Lord, I, I realize that there's people in this house tonight who they don't know you. Some don't think they want to know you. Some could care less if they know you. And, Father God, there's some in here who think they know you. But, Father God, I pray that tonight and through this message that we would have a better understanding of what true abandonment is and how some of us in here need to abandon ourselves, but others in here already feel abandoned and how they need you. And so, Father God, just use this time. Teach us. And, uh, Father God, I just pray that we'll see souls saved and life changed as a result of tonight. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'm going to be coming from uh, 1 Timothy tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you want to go ahead and find that in Scripture. Now, we talked a while ago, and I just asked you about what uh, something looks like when it's abandoned. And... Uh, and, and you all give me some, some pretty good things, but, you know, when I think about something that's been abandoned, um, I think about something that is, has nothing in it anymore. Uh, it's lonely. Uh, maybe it's scary looking. It's rugged. It's torn up. It's jagged. Um, maybe it looks like it's falling apart. It's worn, and it's lifeless. And when I describe that, I wonder if any of you all can look into your life and say that, Maybe you feel that way. Maybe you feel like you're the one who is lonely, lifeless, scared, worn out, empty. A lot of people in here can probably make a direct comparison in between your life and an old empty house. I had Aaron uh, put up a background as an old house, and I'm going to ask him to, to put that up. And I just want us to look at it just for a second, okay? And, and we're going to look at this house, and I want us to see if anybody can see yourself inside of this house. Now, nothing, this is not an optical illusion. Nothing's going to jump out. I, I'm really being serious. Does this house look like your life? Does this house 
look like the way you feel with the relationship that you have with Jesus right now? Does it look like the relationship that you have with your mother and your father or your family or a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Does this look like a relationship that you have at church or at school? Does this house right here look like your soul? Does it have stuff growing up deep inside of it, which is all negativity and weeds? See, weeds are nothing good. Weeds actually take the life out of plants. And so it's got weeds growing up everywhere. All the glass is busted out. With the glass busted out, it could be a symbolization that your eyes have been shattered and you don't see things the way God sees them, but you see things the way you want to see them and the way this world sees them. The paint's starting to peel off of this house. The roof's starting to come loose and it's starting to lean just a little bit. You know, maybe you're not as solid in your foundation with Jesus Christ as you once were. Or maybe there's no foundation there whatsoever. The Bible talks about a wise builder and a man who builds on the rock and a man who builds on the sand. But if we look at that house and we look at, at everything there, how grown up and how negative it looks. I mean, I see absolutely nothing positive with that. But you know what's so awesome is Jesus, when he sees our recklessness and our, our mess like that, when he sees that, that we are a mess and that we are a wreck and that we have been destroyed, instead of giving up on it like a lot of us would do, he says, mm -mm, we're going to do something with it. We're going to change it and make it into something. But guys, there's two types of people in this room tonight. Say two and say, I am one of them. See, there's two types of people. There's one person in here tonight. All of us fall into this category, each and every one of us, even myself and my, my staff. There's one type of person in here tonight, and you feel abandoned. You are abandoned. You feel like that everything in your life, everybody, Gary, has given up on you. You feel like that your mom and your dad, they're, they're so mad and they stay so aggravated with you that, that and they tell you maybe that you're not ever going to amount to nothing and that maybe your life's not worth it or something's not working. And all you hear is this negative stuff all the time. Everything around you seems to be falling apart and crumbling, just like an old abandoned house. And you feel that you've been abandoned by others, maybe even by God. But then there's the person in here tonight, and we need to abandon. We need to abandon ship. We need to let go of what this old world says, we need to let go of what the church says. We need to let go of what this, what this country tells us and what the news tells us and what media tells us. And we need to follow what God says. You see, there's two types of people in here. There's the people who feel abandoned, and then there's the ones of us in here who we need to abandon. Which one are you? Which category would you fall in tonight? I wonder for the people in here who you feel like you're abandoned. You feel like that there's no hope and everybody has given up on you. I wonder, uh, if I read this, would this explain your life? You, you can almost make a direct comparison between your life and a relationship with God, that old empty house, because you feel like everybody has left you. You pray to God that it feels like he's not there. You walk through the halls of your school day in and day out with a fake smile, a fake sense of security, and a fake presence. You feel overwhelmed by all the drama going on at school and at home. And now you just learn that someone you're really close to is either moving away or getting ready to die. You're agitated, you're angry, and you're just plain mad. You're mad at your mom, your teachers, your so-called friends, your dad, your family. You're even mad at yourself. Worst of all, you're mad at God. Your house, your soul, not the physical house that you go home to tonight, but this house right here, Under Armour says protect this house. So if you're going to protect this house, what you've got to do is put a little work into it and not leave it abandoned because it has not been abandoned. See, where I, where I get so messed up is by so many young people in the generation today are so talked down upon by parents and teachers and elders in the church. See, the problem isn't the young people. 
I'm going to be honest, and I'm, I'm on your guys' side tonight, so check this out. The problem is not you all. It's the generations above you who refuse to do absolutely nothing but talk bad about you day in and day out. The problem is not the teenagers. The problem right now is the adults who refuse to do nothing. But praise God, we've got staff and teachers and principals in this community who love young people. We invest in young people, Spencer, because we know that you can do something different. But did you know statistically, watch this, stand up. Stand up, stand up, stand up for me. There are four of you. Watch this. Sit down, sit down, and sit down. Statistics say, statistics say that out of every four young people, out of every four young people, right now, we are failing three of them and only takes care of one. Now, I don't know about you guys, being the young people, but how many of you all say that you would like to see a change in the future? Is there anybody in here who would like to see some change? I'm not talking about any kind of change you talked about in the federal government, not that kind of change, because that's not good change. But is there anybody in here that would like to see some change in something? Maybe a cleaner atmosphere, maybe people who still respect people? You check this out. All right, you can put your hands down. This summer, this summer, uh, we were out, and I had uh, four or five teenagers, some of some of you all, with me, and we walked into a store. And, and I notice stuff. I pick up on stuff a lot. I love to watch people. I do people watching like uh, Gary and Brent do. And uh, so anyway, uh, we were we were I was people watching with these teenagers, and so I walk into a store. And the teenagers, Jenna, they let the door slam in the face of an elderly woman who was coming into the store behi- and behind me and in front of them. They, instead of stopping and holding the door, these four teenagers that were with me, a part of this group, let the door slam in her face. Christian, leader, churchgoers, they had no respect because they had never been taught. Now, guess, listen, here's the deal. You can never say that you have never been taught about the love and the grace of Jesus Christ and mess up because I am telling you tonight that his grace is always sufficient and his love is there and he has a plan for you and there's so much more than what this old world tells you. I tell you guys all the time, and the reason I tell you so much is because they say if you hear something like 23 times, eventually you remember it. So I'm going to tell you 2,300 times so eventually you'll remember it that God has a plan for you. Ladies, that you are beautiful exactly the way you are. And God made you that way for a reason. Guys, the same thing for you all, even though y'all uglier than sin. Y'all ugly. And it ain't easy for me to sit up here and say y'all pretty, but because Jesus loves you, you are. And so God has a plan for you too. But the thing is, is this world has so much negativity that we have to feel like We have been abandoned by everybody. Is there anybody in here who can raise your hand and you say that you feel like you have been abandoned by either a a, a father, a mother, or some leader in your life? Is anybody in here can say you've ever been abandoned by somebody? Ever. It's ever happened. Raise your hand high. I want you to look at your staff. Look at this student. Look around. Look at all of these students and these teachers and these staff who are saying that at one point in time, They have been abandoned by someone. You can put your hand down. Can I tell you about a man tonight? And this is a silly illustration, but I want you to think about it. Y'all know those life rings at the pool? You know what I'm talking about, hanging on the fence? And, man, every time I've ever been at a public pool, I just want to get one of them things off and sling it at somebody. Y'all ever want to do that? I know nobody else thinks like that, but I I just want to get that thing and just like like some little kid out in the pool be like, Mommy, Mommy, look! And I'm like, whoo, bam, oh! You know? It wasn't me. It's the lifeguard up there. I didn't do it. You know, but but I wanted I, I've always wanted to do that. But I think about what if Jesus had that life ring, and where you feel like you've been abandoned and you're sinking in that pool, that pool of sin and that pool of lust and that that pool of addiction and that pool of mess that just keeps pulling you down. And it's almost like quicksand because you can't catch your breath. Therefore, you're depressed and you're angry and you're suicidal and you're cutting and you've got all these problems in your life and you can't seem to even find anything 
But the good thing is, is that Jesus Christ is not like me, and he wouldn't throw it at you to hit you. He would throw it at you to save you. And the thing is, is he's doing that tonight because some of you in this room, if we were truly honest, are thinking, Daniel, I'm fine. I'm a Christian. Daniel, I'm fine. I went on a Christmas walk. Daniel, I'm fine. I've been called to preach. Daniel, I'm fine. My mom and dad go to church. Daniel, I'm fine. I pray to God. Daniel, I'm fine. I go to I go to real life. Daniel, I'm fine. I go to McPrayer. Daniel, I'm fine. All this stuff's okay. Hey, yeah, I'm good, Daniel. Good to see you too. I'm smiling. But as soon as I walk past you, that smile turns to frown because you were so depressed and so angry and so hurt because people in your life have been telling you how useless you are and that you'll never amount to nothing. And you are so angry about it that you are willing to do whatever it takes, even if it makes yourself become loose, messing around with people, even if it means you hold a bad reputation because you've become the, the school alcoholic or the, the guy that everybody runs to to get some kind of prescription drug, you are willing to do whatever it takes to make yourself look high because everybody else has told you how low you are. Can I tell you tonight that you have not been abandoned? And I can tell you that you've not been abandoned because I am standing up here tonight holding the life ring that can save you, and his name is Jesus Christ. Will anybody in this room accept this life ring tonight? Because I have it, and it's ready and available. Amen? But then there's the ones of us in this room tonight. I told you there's two types of people. There's the person who feels abandoned, and then there's the ones of us who need to abandon. And for the ones of us who need to abandon, we need to abandon, and we need to go fast. I looked at uh, some different shipwrecks today as I was thinking about a, a title for this message and reading with the Scripture. And so the reason I came up with aba uh, abandon is because in 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says this. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. In other, li in other words, they don't feel anything anymore. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created them to receive by thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. Check this out. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and by prayer. And in verse 7 it says, Have nothing, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Brandon, right? Stand up. I don't know about you guys, and I'm not going to point, I, I am going to point him out. So I want you to look at this dude. All right? How are you? Where you been? Two fifteen, man. That's, I was doing that when I was three. You know, I mean, well, no, I'm just kidding. This dude, look, I mean, look at, wow. Like as soon as he graduates, I'm bringing him back for security. Like he's on the security team here at Real Life, and he comes back. Okay, but I want you to look at this. You train, you play football, right? So you train a lot. All right, Justin, you play football. Dalton, okay. So I got some football players up here, up front row. Seth, what? <laughs> Seth is on the bench. Okay. All right, you sit down, Brandon. Thank you. These guys train a whole lot, and there's a lot of athletes in here, okay? And we got to physically train. Now, I train a whole lot, too. I train at seeing which cookie tastes best with which type of drink. Anybody know what I'm saying? That's the kind of training I do. takes a whole lot of effort. But my favorite so far is still the Oreo and a glass of milk. Amen? There ain't nothing like that. And so a lot of training. Very rigorous. Hey, but it pays off. Look at the muscle, you know? I mean, look at the muscle. And, uh, but check this out, check this out. There's a lot of us in this room who we train physically. But Donnie, God's word tells us that that physical training is not worth anything unless we have godly training. 
Now, the godly training that we receive is what you're getting tonight. It should be what you receive on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And it should be through the personal walk that you have with Jesus Christ. But for a lot of us in this room, we have gotten so beaten down and so beat up by the things of this world that the physical training is all that's taking part in our life, and the spiritual training has nothing. It says, for physical training is of some value. So he says that's good. He says, stay in shape. It's Paul writing this letter to Timothy. Okay? Paul says, stay in shape. He does. He says it in the Bible. I guess I need to listen to that. It says, uh, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise, holding promise, for both the present life and the life that's to come. Can I tell you something, young people? I don't care what the world says. Having sex outside of marriage is not okay. Okay? Now, I'm going to hurt some feelings, and I'm going to make some people mad, and you can get mad and run and not come back to real life. And listen, you can get all over Facebook and bash me. You're not the first person. You're not going to be the last person. Have fun. Homosexuality is not right. God does not honor that. I didn't say God didn't love them. I didn't say that I didn't love them. But I'm saying that lifestyle is not one that God intended to be. I'll tell you something else. Drinking, drugging, smoking. And you know what I love? I love this, Donna. I, I've spoken at a ton of revivals and schools and everything all across this state, even up in Ohio and Tennessee. And I love young people because young people go, well, all these preachers ever talk about is, smoking and drinking and premarital sex. And I go, yeah, you're exactly right. We do talk about that a lot, Tony. But until you guys get it right and stop doing it, I'm going to keep talking about it. Because the problem is, is I say it and I preach and I preach and I tell you and I tell you what God's Word says. And I'm telling you because this man right here messed up. This man right here went way too far. This man right here had some mess, mistakes in his life and messed up. But praise God, I come out of it. So I'm not telling you that you need to go try it so you can be like me and try to come out of it because it may not work that way for you and you may get become an alcoholic. You may become a drug addict. You may become a daddy at the age of 13 and have a bunch of babies to pay and you don't have any money to pay for those diapers and all that food and then you're some deadbeat little punk running around. I tell you this because I don't want you to go there. I tell you this not because I'm any better, because I've arrived, because, guys, I am the same mess as each and every one of us in this room is. But God reached down, and he got a hold of me when I felt like I was abandoned and nobody cared. And he brought me up, and he said, if you will abandon the things of this world, Daniel Cook, then I will put a voice in you. I spoke at a hoot this past Sunday night, and I told some young ladies, some young men that were there, and I said, here's the deal. God called me to preach. I didn't say I was a good preacher. I'm not saying that people like listening to my teaching. I'm not saying that people are ever going to come by the thousands. They may, they may not. Here's the deal. When God called me, the reason he called me is because he gives me the gift to be able to stand up in front of people and to just go to town. I can talk to the best of them. I, I'll talk to a tree. You ought to hear me sometimes. I literally, I walk around talking to myself. Hey, look at me like you're an idiot. I do, man. I talk to myself. I'm like, Man, Daniel, that was stupid. Man, that really was stupid, Daniel. Why did you do that? Man, I don't know, Daniel. Why did you do that? You know, y'all ever do that? Whatever, you weirdos. Y'all are lying. Y'all do do that. Everybody talks to yourself. You know, we've all got that stuff in our life. We've all got a mess in our life. But God says, guys, he wants to take it, and if we will abandon it and turn to him, then we will find what he has for us. See, this whole world, it does. It lies to us. Man, man, it, it lies to us big time. This world wants you to think that you are number one. This world wants you to think that everything revolves around you. You get whatever you want whenever you need it. And see, some of you in here, if I was to speak truth, still live by that. Because what happens is mom and daddy take something away from you, and then you go crying and whining back, well, I'll be a good little boy. I'll be a good little girl. I won't ever do it again. And then you get something back, right? Yeah, we know how to play these games. And the thing is, the world has taught us that it's all about us. But can I tell you that it is not? And that you have to abandon that feeling. And you have to trust in the Lord. See, when Jesus Christ, 
He was a man which a lot of people just say, oh, he was a prophet, or he was a sinless man. I believe he lived on this earth, and he walked upon this earth with the best of the prophets. And some kind of big doctoral excuse. But here's the deal. Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And what you know what I love about Jesus is that when he came here, Casey, when Jesus came here, he was born in a manger. Just like Greg said last week, he was born in a manger in the lowest places of all places to be born. Anybody else in here ever been born in a manger? Didn't think so. So he's, he's already got one up on us, right? Anybody in here ever raised anybody from the dead? Okay, so we got two up on us, all right. Anybody in here ever give sight to the blind? Y'all lying. AJ, when the last time you give sight to the blind? Yesterday? Who was it? Did they see it coming? No, they didn't see it coming because you give them sight. All right, all right, so check this out. <laughs> Jesus came, and he was what no other man, no other woman, would ever have to be for you. He came that so you could abandon the thoughts of loneliness. He came so you could abandon the thought of depression. He came so you could abandon the thought of suicide. He came so you could lay all of that stuff aside and realize that you are so much more and that he has a purpose for you. You say, yeah, you say that all the time. People say that all the time. My pastor says that all the time. But if that's, the, if that's the thing then, Daniel, why don't I feel it? You know why? It's because here's what people do. People are like, and, and, and I swear this is the way it happens. We'll be like, all right, uh, right now in, in our Sunday morning services, uh, Brother Brian is speaking on prosperity, okay? And the prosperity uh, that he's been talking about, and we've wrapped that sermon series up, but the prosperity he's talking about is God has called us to give, and, and in return, if we give, he will give back to us, okay? So here's people's excuse. I, I'm not kidding you. They'll literally do this. They'll say, well, I give to God, and God has done absolutely nothing for me. It's been a week, and you're telling me that you're judging because you gave one time to God that he is not faithful to you? Somebody said you woke up this morning. That's exactly right. Somebody said that they more than likely woke up with some clothes on their back, or at least I hope they did, because if not, that would have been scary. See, you had the opportunity, whether or not you partake of the food tonight, you had the opportunity to eat. You had the opportunity to sit in a, in a sheltered facility with clothes on your back, with no people standing anywhere, with guns guarding us, because we live in a free country. But tell me, God is not good? Guys, do you not see how much he loves you? Can you not see that his hand is upon this country? There is a plague of locusts in Egypt at this very moment. A plague of locusts. Biblical proportions. I mean, locusts. Everybody know what I'm talking about? The nasty little things be flying through the air. All, you know what I'm talking about? Man, I can't stand bugs. You know, they, you know how mosquitoes sound that fly up to your ear? Like, you know, you're like, ah. And then you didn't even get the thing. It lands on your nose or something, you know. But anyway, I, I got these, these locusts, and they're flying through Egypt. Could you imagine? Do you realize what that is doing? Aaron, that's eating their crops. That's taking everything that they've got. But yet God is not a God who loves us. How many people have got clothes on their back? How many, how many of you all? And don't, don't act silly. There may be somebody, but I, I seriously doubt it. Is there anybody in here that when you leave here, and please be serious, don't be joking around, is there anybody in here that has to go back to like a cardboard box or anything? I didn't think so. How many of you all has had someone today tell you that they love you? Well, for the rest of you that's not raising your hands, I love you. So there you go. Now you can raise your hand. So check this out. Don't dare tell me that God has abandoned you. But in all reality, what it is is that you've abandoned God. See, we want to blame everything on God because he's the all-knowing and the almighty and the all got everything going on for him. But the problem is, is this, guys. We have got so much stuff in our life 
that is keeping us from understanding his will and his purpose and his reason. And we put so much blame on him instead of blame on ourselves. See, we say he's not a good God. We say, how could he love me? How could he do this? He made so-and-so die in my life. He didn't make them die. Death's coming to us all. Anybody in here? Everybody in here is going to die. We are. We are all going to die. The thing is, death's coming. God didn't make them die. It was just their time to clock out. Now, the way they lived their life may have contributed to it. That's a whole other sermon. But check this out. God didn't make them die. God did not take your daddy. God did not take your mama. God didn't take grandma and granddaddy. God did not take them from you. In fact, he gave them to you for the time that you had with them so that you could learn something. But were you too busy and were you too selfish that all you were worried about was some girl or some guy or some friend or some sport or some school event or some church event that you missed out on what God was trying to show you through that person? So I don't know about you guys, but I have missed signs in my life before where God was trying to teach me and show me. But I missed it because I was too busy. And the thing is, tonight in this room, there is someone in here who you were so busy and so worried about everything going on around you and everything going on at home and what's going on on your cell phone that you're missing out. And God is telling you this. You have not been abandoned, but you need to abandon. You need to abandon the way of life as you see it right now. Because, guys, this world is full of absolutely nothing but hate. This world wants nothing from us. This world, all they want is our money and our time. But God says, give me your heart. God says, give me your heart. But let me clear up something. And as excuse me, as the worship team comes, I want you guys to focus in on this. It's not that, it's not that God, once you accept him into your life, everything's going to go, ooh, super easy. Wow, that was, that was cool. Got it all taken care of. I've got some new Christians in the house. Y'all have only been saved for about a month or under. Who are my new Christians in the house? You've only been saved for about a month or so? All right, check this out. When you all got saved, was it automatically the desire of lust and the desire to sin, was it automatically just taken away? It wasn't. Because that desire is still going to be there. You just have to work through it. And so the thing is in here tonight, I'm not telling you, that if you've been cutting yourself and if you've been suicidal and if you're on drugs and if you're messing around with some guy, I'm not saying if you come up tonight and accept Jesus into your heart, that it's all gone and all taken care of. Your sins are forgiven, but that the situations and those problems are not going to leave. In fact, they're going to be stronger and harder. But that's where you have to understand that God's not going to abandon you like you've abandoned him. I mean, he has a purpose for you. Check this out real quick. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Some of you in here tonight need to have a night where you abandon this world and you quit being a slave to what mom, dad, what your past, what your school, what your so-called friends, what media. You need to quit being a slave to that and abandon it and come to Jesus. And for the other ones in here who feel like you've been abandoned and that nobody cares, If I didn't care, I promise you I would not be standing up here right now. I promise you that the men and the women that are in this room, that are surrounding this room, and while you are sitting here, they are praying for you. The men and the women that are surrounding this room, and even the ones who are not here tonight, and who may be sitting at home, and who I have called specifically and asked them to pray for Real Life Student Ministry, maybe you don't realize this. But they are lifting you up in prayer at this very moment because they want you to understand that there's more to life than what this old world holds. There's more to life.
than what some guy says sex is going to be like for the first time. There's more to life than what that blunt's going to do for you. There's more to life than what everything else says is going to happen, and it's called Jesus Christ. And he's right here. I've got the life preserver in my hand. Is there anybody in this room tonight who needs to be saved by Jesus Christ and you want this life preserver because he is pulling you up from the sinking mess and the sinking world. If you need it, I'm begging you under the authority and the unction of Jesus Christ to make your way to this altar right now. I want you to stand in this room, and if you are lost and need Jesus, you come down here right now. Don't run from it. Don't wait on it, because His grace has got you covered. And if you need to pray, this altar is open. Don't worry about it, Bible. Even you what anybody else is going to think or say or do because it doesn't matter. Who cares? They got their own junk in their trunk mess in their life. You get it right tonight with where you need to be with Jesus Christ.